This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace to you and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship at the First Presbyterian Church of Warminster, and a special welcome to those who worship with us through WRDB-FM radio. Today's liturgist is Jenny, and our musical gifts are offered by Kathy Worth Balkus on organ and piano, and our senior choir conducted by our director of music, Dave Sadler. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Worship begins with the sounding of the chimes. Before turning to scripture, let us pray. Shine within our hearts, loving master, the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our minds that we may comprehend the message of your gospel. Amen. I'll be reading select verses from 1 Kings chapters two and 13. Then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David and his kingdom was firmly established. Solomon loved the Lord walking in the statutes of his father David, only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself, long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Ephesians 5 15 through 20. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And our gospel lesson is from the sixth chapter of John, verses 51 through 58. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now I think it's safe to guess that almost everyone listening today owns a Bible, possibly even two or three of them. You might have a family Bible handed down to you from a parent or grandparent. You might also have a Bible given to you when you were a child from the church where you grew up, when you reached a certain age or left home for college. I'll bet many of you have annotated Bibles with commentary in the margins and detailed maps and timetables. No doubt some of you, especially if you're on the younger side, have digital Bibles on your computers or mobile devices. You might also favor a particular translation of scripture, such as the new revised standard version that we use every Sunday, or perhaps the new international version. And of course, the King James version might be your favorite, not only because so many of us grew up with it, but also because its beautiful language resonates with the style of Shakespeare, which is no coincidence because the King James translation was composed during Shakespeare's own time. But regardless of what type of Bible or which translation each of us might prefer, we know that a Bible sitting on a bookshelf or downloaded to a phone is one thing, but it's another thing altogether to read and to live according to what's written on the pages. Christians are a people of the word, not because we display Bibles in our homes and in our sanctuaries, but because every week we gather together around the word in a spirit of worship to proclaim scripture, to cling to its promises, and to bring to it our struggles and questions. But ultimately, we gather around the word to be nourished by it. A Bible sitting on a shelf unread is no different from a feast sitting on a table uneaten. That's why I think it's more accurate to approach the scriptures not as a book or a collection of writings, but as the place where we are fed. We don't read the Bible merely for knowledge or intellectual stimulation, although it can give us that. We read the Bible because we hunger and thirst for righteousness. And we know that without a steady diet of God's holy word, we will fail 
to thrive. I use this metaphor of spiritual nurture because we're about to step over the threshold from the Old Testament accounts of the establishment of a monarchy in ancient Israel into another area of scripture called the wisdom tradition. Now, this tradition is rooted in a movement that developed over centuries of reflection and discernment that produced an entire genre of writings in the Old Testament. And we'll hear from some of these writings in the coming weeks, such as from Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And what emerged from this movement is the humble acknowledgement that there lies a vast distance between human wisdom and the wisdom of God. And that there is no way for us to attain divine wisdom on our own. Only God can reach across that distance by entering into the messiness and complexity of human experience to nourish us like a mother feeds her children. The Proverbs even goes so far as to portray divine wisdom as a woman who builds a magnificent house and invites us to come inside to where a meal has been prepared for us. Come, she says, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. In our Old Testament lesson, the newly anointed King Solomon recognizes his hunger for God to give him an understanding and discerning mind and the wisdom to know the difference between good and evil. And it's this legendary prayer of Solomon that sets him apart as not only the wisest among all the kings of Israel, but among all the world rulers of his time. But although Solomon is remembered as the wisest of Israel's kings, if you were to follow his story from this point on over the next 10 chapters or so, you will find that somewhere along the way, Solomon's heart starts listening to other voices because by the end of his story, what began as a true hunger and thirst for God's wisdom devolves into an appetite to amass power and wealth at the cost of exploiting his people and enslaving the resident aliens who live within his domain. And the mistake that mo makes the most devastating and lasting impact on his people is that at the height of his power, Solomon starts worshiping other gods. It likely began for practical reasons since his power depends on strategic alliances with foreign kings who worship other gods. Also, many of his wives worshiped these other gods. And at first, Solomon sees no harm in paying homage to them. After all, it's in the spirit of good foreign relations. But then it soon becomes a slippery slope. Solomon might have been smart, but he was not always wise. But I think the fundamental flaw is that Solomon gains power and prestige among the nations, but we rarely see him returning to God, returning with a listening heart for more wisdom. Instead, as time goes on, he can no longer discern the difference between good and evil because somewhere along the way, Solomon lost his appetite for true wisdom. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, Jesus says. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. 
and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. We are all prone to confusing our appetite for true wisdom, for that which does not nourish us. And we might think one helping of wisdom is enough for a lifetime. The scripture reminds us that we are to give ourselves to the one who feeds us not with just words from a page, but with his own flesh and blood. By giving himself to us, Jesus promises that through believing in him, we may feast on the eternal life and love and wisdom of God, not just after we die, but now, here, together. But believing, Jesus tells us, is not just an intellectual acknowledgement of who he is. Believing means constantly turning our entire lives toward him in a posture of humility, worship, and hunger. Friends, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Now let us turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. God of heaven and earth, you call us to come in humility before you, bringing the offering of our very selves. 
We thank you for sending your son to seek and to save the lost. May we who have been baptized in his name never turn away from the world, but reach out in love. We pray for our country, for its people and our leaders. We pray that you would bring healing to the divisions that lead neighbors to judge each other as enemies. Help us to show the way of Jesus, who rules not by force nor by might, but by self-giving love and humility. Give us the strength we need to fulfill our vision, to be a beacon of light and hope to the world. Lord, we pray for those loved ones whose needs are known to us, but especially we pray for those whose needs are known only by you. Holy God, you claimed our lives in baptism that we might die to sin and be raised with him to new life. So give us listening hearts and obedient wills to keep us faithful always in your service. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray together. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve our neighbors. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen.